Hello everyone, in this episode of Motive Garage, we install a MoTeC into our Yaris to become number one. So if you've been watching our Yaris development, you know that our goal is to go fast, both around the circuit and the quarter mile. Now the problem is right now, the chassis development has gone pretty well, but we are still pretty much got stock power. And the factory ECU in this car is not only looking like it's not crackable, it also has a lot of nannies in it that mean that when you do other mods, it pulls the power back out anyway. Our Yaris just basically wasn't any quicker in a straight line in the real world than what it was dead stock. So it was quite frustrating. Now, we knew we had two options. We could either look at some type of piggyback or interceptor, or we could go for a complete ECU. Now with the piggybacks and interceptors, we looked at a few things. We were dubious on some results. We did actually try a couple of options that didn't really work. And we were almost settled on an option that we we're gonna go for. Now the other option is aftermarket ECU. Now there are only very few ECUs on the market that can completely integrate into all the factory systems so that you get a car that still drives and behaves like a new car, but then is completely programmable. One of them is MoTeC. Now, a lot of people with a Yaris will say, well, that's quite expensive, but you wanna go fast, things cost money. Now, we were a little bit undecided and we had the car on hold a little bit until I got a phone call from Ryan from Powertune Australia that basically went like this. Hi, Andrew. We've got a MoTeC working in a Yaris, but he's off doing some other experimenting. If we lend you a MoTeC and put it in your car, what will you do? And my reply was, Pretty simple. Put it in the car, tune it, and I'll go straight to the track and get our lap record back at Wakefield, and then I'll go to the drags and I'll break the current world record for a Yaris. And they went, huh, that sounds pretty good. Let's do it. So, off the pouch, and we go. So in the Toyota Yaris, Toyota has utilized a new Denso ECU. Now with those new Denso ECUs, there's a whole bunch of new functionality that's been added to the car, like lane keeping, um, active emergency braking, and things like that. And with the introduction of that, they've also added security features that's basically stopped people from cracking into those ECU and making changes purely from a safety perspective. So because this ECU is uncrackable or you know, difficult to crack, there are a couple of options you know, that in the aftermarket world that you can utilise on the car. They're generally things such as interceptors or signal benders, um, where we manipulate signals such as the map sensor, a fuel ratio sensor, other sensors around the engine, and trick the factory ECU into believing that something else is happening in the engine. And the closed loop systems within the ECU compensate for that, and then magically you make more power. Now, this isn't typically a very safe idea, especially when you start upsizing turbos, adding you know, larger exhausts, and trying to make you know, large amounts of additional power. So realistically, the only option for, for those cars is to completely replace the factory ECU with an aftermarket item. There's a massive caveat when you go to add an aftermarket ECU into any modern car, and that is the CAN bus system. Pretty much anything that's old school, you know, your GDRs, your Supras, and, and cars like that, they're pre-CAN bus. And what that means is that basically you can stick an aftermarket ECU in, it runs the engine, it does the job, and the rest of the car runs from relays and other bits and pieces that aren't controlled from any form of computer. Anything newer than around 2008 incorporates CAN bus. Now, CAN bus is effectively a computer network inside your car that connects things such as four-wheel drive controllers, ABS units, steering angles, all sorts of other modules that are within a modern car and allows all the different modules to communicate with each other. Now, replacing one of those modules, being the ECU, you run into a problem where all of those modules in the car don't really know what's going on on the network anymore. You have big problems where your dashboard lights up like a Christmas tree and systems don't work properly. ABS doesn't work, your four-wheel drive control no longer works, the car becomes a front-wheel drive, you know, and it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. So pretty much anything newer than 2008 requires some form of integration with the vehicle's CAN bus system. So the difference with all the aftermarket ECUs is their ability to communicate on that CAN bus network. Uh, there's only a limited number of franchises or, or brands of ECUs that allow CAN bus communication on multiple CAN networks at any given time. MoTeC um, allows three separate CAN bus networks to be communicated on at the, at 
the same point in time. It's not just the ability to communicate on those networks that allows us to put this ECU into the car. There's a whole bunch of other things that need to occur inside that ECU in order to communicate with those modules. So some of those things that you need to do inside of the ECU effectively are, you know, communicate with the ABS unit, let it know that, you know, you're, you're sending out torque requests, you're sending out engine speed, vehicles, you know, all those different sensors inside the car, you're communicating that to the ABS, and the ABS module is then responding based on that information. So you can't just say engine speed and just spew it out onto the network somewhere randomly. It has to be in a, a particular spot that that module is actually expecting to see. Um, and we actually need to perform reverse engineering on the factory CAN bus to obtain that location, program that into the ECU, and then have it transmit out in the correct location. When we look at reverse engineering, there's a whole bunch of uh, criteria that needs to be looked at and understood before you can actually just jump in and start programming signals. Now, there's typically a group of um, ECU manufacturers out there, such as Continental, Bosch, Denso, they're kind of the big names that, that are in most OE vehicles. They have similar signals within each of those ECUs, but they vary based on manufacturer. So you might say, for example, find a Denso ECU in a Toyota. You might also find it in another franchise vehicle. Um, and the CAN signals will be similar, but not the same, which means that you can't take the, the, you know, the programming in one ECU, dump it into another one, and it just works. It just doesn't happen. The complication with it is just how complex the individual messages are. So within a single message, there could be 255 different signal states. And say, take for example the Yaris, there is over 50 to 60 messages. Now, those messages are transmitted on a, generally a schedule of around 200 times per second. So that probably gives you a bit of an idea as to how many messages are transmitted on the CAN bus at any given time within you know, one second of time. So my job here is effectively a software engineer. Now, what I basically do is I'll take a brand new car, say for example, the Toyota Yaris, I'll connect my equipment to that car, um, and I'll spend sometimes up to four, five, six weeks on that car, depending on how complicated and complex that is. I'll reverse all of that factory information back out into my own format, and then I'll program that in, in computer talk, so to speak, um, into the MoTeC unit um, so that it communicates as the factory ECU. So all the modules in the car believe that the factory ECU is still installed, um, and they're none the wiser. That allows us to also manipulate certain signals also to gain better control over different modules. One good example of you know, a module within the car that we might like to manipulate a signal for is the center diff or the four-wheel drive controller in the Yaris. Now, that four-wheel drive controller basically um, takes a torque signal from the ECU, looks at how much torque is being generated, looks at things such as vehicle speed, engine speed, steering angle, and all sorts of other bits and pieces, and it makes its adjustments internally. Now, we can't control that module. However, we can trick it into, uh, into receiving more torque than what's actually occurring. Now, the, um, the effect of sending more torque may be that the clutch packs inside that lock up tighter. So therefore, you get a tighter full drive setup. Um, you might be able to adjust the split depending on how much torque that you're actually inputting. So you might get to a situation where if you, let's say, command 700 newton meters of torque, and you're actually parking in a car park, you'll find that the car binds up. Um, however, that can be you know, programmed across all different axes so that you can control that module by manipulating the signal being sent to it. So this whole project, or the Yaris project for us, um, started once the, you know, the Yaris come out and we could actually procure a car. So that was the first task. Once we got the car, it's probably a period of around three to four weeks with the Yaris, um, reverse engineering not only the CAN bus, but also sensor scalings, sensor signals, understanding how the engine works. And in particular, this being a DI engine, there's a whole bunch of sensors, a whole bunch of other configuration that needs to occur. And once that was all done, we then had to start on the wiring side of things. So the project itself sort of drags out and can be, you know, in this particular case, around sort of two to three months. When we actually do this reverse engineering of the actual sensor data, you know, the, the cam timing, the ignition timing, and things like that, what we can actually do is we can use our tooling, connect to the vehicle, we can drive around on the factory ECU, we can pretty much suck out typically a, a base timing map. Now, it's not always exactly what the factory has, but it's very close. Well, the same with the camshaft, you know, um, camshaft timing. Um, when it comes to the direct inject injection side though, that's a separate thing. That's where we actually need to measure the individual sensors. We need to put a degree wheel onto the engine. We need to turn it around and we actually basically generate the 
uh, lobe profile that's within the exhaust camshaft for the high pressure fuel pump. Um, that all gets programmed into the MoTeC. There's no sort of ability to just suck that information out because it's physical hardware inside the engine. Um, but when it comes to the software, we are able to suck things like you know, the ignition timing map out um, and we can sort of create a base map from that. And then once we put that car onto the dyno, we can then refine that and, and we generate a base map from that. So the reason that we've utilised the MoTeC um, with most of our, our new engines um, is because of the, the capabilities that the ECU has in terms of hardware. Now, it can drive you know, four infinitely variable camshafts, it can drive multiple electronic throttle bodies, it can drive multiple um, wastegates, electronic wastegates. Um, it can control all those types of things, and in particular in, in the Yaris's case, it's also able to drive the direct injector um, injectors themselves. Now, in the case of, of direct injectors, this is, you know, voltage is anywhere up to 190 volts on an injector, um, where typically a standard ECU wouldn't be able to, to, to cater for that, and it's not simply low side output where it just grounds, you know, a, a signal to the injector and the injector turns on. This actually uses like a peak and hold system, similar to what most people would be familiar with um, in terms of bigger injectors, um, and it actually amplifies that massively. Like I said, like 190 volts, you know, 30, 40 amps, um, all internally of the ECU. Now, like this, this MoTeC hardware is able to deal with, you know, six, eight, 12 cylinders of that. Um, so it's, it's something that, that other ECU manufacturers just don't have in their ECUs. Now, that's, that could be just purely because it's an expensive exercise to put that in there, um, but this is pretty much your only choice in terms of direct injection in a modern engine. So the good thing with the MoTeC is that it is really one box. That means that no, no injector drivers that, you know, that has to hang off it or anything like that. It's all internal of the ECU and it's just one box that you put inside the car. Now, with that um, comes a cost generally. Um, so some of the other alternative ECUs, you may be able to put the ECU in the car, but it will require maybe four injector drivers or something like that. Um, purely from a cost point of view, that's why we believe the other manufacturers may have done that. Um, but with the MoTeC, with the DI stuff, it's all one box, one ECU. So one of the questions that we get is, why is it so expensive to put you know, this MoTeC in my Yaris? Now, as I explained before, there's weeks of development that goes into this. There's also a whole bunch of other stuff that comes within the kit that gets delivered to you when you purchase it. Now, it's not just the ECU. You get things such as an adapter box, the mounting solution, the wiring, a base file, a fully fledged logging suite for the vehicle, um, and everything else that you need to literally plug this ECU into your car, hit the button and drive it. There's no, oh, I need to touch up the tune here and there. The base file that goes into the car, you can put it in the car, start it, drive it. Drive it for two weeks until your tune is ready to, to turn the power up in the car. So one of the questions with the base map that we get is, is it safe for my car? Now, the way that the base map is designed is so that we can put this in any vehicle, whether it be here, whether it be in Perth, whether it be across the other side of the world, you put it into the vehicle and it should make pretty much the same power as it did from factory. Now, we don't turn the power up, we don't put extra timing and we don't put extra boost into the base map. That's purely because we don't know the modifications that are done to the individual vehicles and we base it off a standard car. So we, we take the standard vehicle, we make sure that the parameters are safe. We know that, okay, you know, maybe you might get a bad, bad batch of fuel or, or something, you know, circumstances change. Um, that's not going to hurt the engine. So that's why our base files make the same power as standard and not, you know, 30 kilowatts more. So the good thing about these base files is that when the car does go to your tuner, basically he is able to adjust the ignition timing, adjust the fueling to suit, you know, your requirements, whether it be E85, 98, make small changes to things like boost, and you, you pretty much, you, your tune will be there. Things such as cam timing, all the injection timing, all the injector scaling, and everything else has already been done for them. Um, that's the beauty of these base maps and having them so comprehensive. Like I mentioned, the price of this kit is probably a little bit more than if you went to another manufacturer, grabbed one of their off-the-shelf items, you know, and, and then decided to wire it in yourself. However, what you are also paying for, like I mentioned, is the ability to have a kit. And now, what that means is that we've, we've done all the wiring for you, all the mounts are all, all in place, you literally remove the factory ECU, replace it with this one, 
hit the start button. Now, if you were to wire in your own ECU, you would need to get a wiring diagram from somewhere. You would need to you know, make up some form of a patch harness or something like that, which takes hours. And especially in the case of the Yaris, where you know, you've got a header that's over 240 pins, um, that's a lot of wiring, a lot of time, and a lot of hand crimping, which you don't want to have to do, let's face it. So you know, th when it comes down to price, all this has been incorporated so that literally the price that you pay is for a kit that you just put into your car, hit the button, drive away. So the other benefit is that you're possibly also going to save on tuning costs. Now, if your tuner charges by the hour, like I mentioned, you don't need to, he doesn't need to adjust things such as cam timing, um, fuel injection timing and things like that. It's, it's all done for him. So therefore, it's literally fuel, boost, timing, car off the dyno. So if you're paying by the hour, your tune is likely to be cheaper as well. So at the moment, when you purchase one of these Yaris kits, um, you'll, you'll get a patch harness. Now, the patch harness basically consists of um, your Motec ECU connectors at one end and the factory ECU header at the other. What this means is you disconnect the factory ECU, you connect your factory wiring to one end of this harness and the other end into the Motec ECU. Now, this is how the kit is currently. However, moving forward as, you know, as we develop things and change things around, there's also now a new patch box. Now, the patch box basically means that all of this loom is internal of this box, and this box now mounts to the back of the ECU and mounts in the factory location. This means no zip ties and, and things like that when you actually install the loom into the car. Motex now in the car, been about an hour on the dyno. What we had to do in order to tune the car from the base file to, to this current tuned example was basically manipulate boost, set a little bit more aggressive time curve, alter the fueling just slightly to, to just cater for the fuel that, that's currently in the car. And we've seen some pretty good gains of around you know 40 kilowatts or, or, or more. We've been able to basically implement more boost earlier and maintain that extra boost uh, through, the, through the mid range, which translates to a large torque hit down low and more power up top. So what you're probably likely to see is you know, more mile an hour if you were going to drag race the car. You'll also find that the car is more punchy, a lot more torque to, to drive out of corners on, in a circuit you know, application. There is nowhere on the, on the power curve that we basically are in line or below the factory power. We've made more everywhere. So you've probably noticed that the car behind me sitting in the rollers only on the front tyres. Uh, the back tyres are out of the rollers. And you're probably wondering, hey, the car's a four-wheel drive car. Why is it set up like this on the dyno? Now, we've found a number of different things with this car and how it actually responds or is, um, you know, shifts the torque around. Now, with this particular dyno um, and a number of others that we've utilised, we've found that the, the dyno is trying to control the torque on the front and rear axle of the car. The car is effectively fighting that and you can see different skewed power figures. Now, when I say skewed, I mean that you could do one run, the car might, let's say, make 200 kilowatts. On the next run, it'll tell you that it made 250. Simply not the case. It's the, the internal full drive controller inside the car that's actually shifting the power around and giving you false readings on the dyno. Now, that may not happen to everybody on every dyno because every single dyno is different. However, in our case, that's what was happening. And to make the, the car more repeatable and consistent on the dyno and allow us to actually fine tune and, and understand that when we make a change, that's what we're seeing on the dyno. We've removed the tail shaft from the car, 
We've put it onto the, the front rollers only, and we're now able to get consistent back-to-back -back runs that are within 1.5 or thereabouts kilowatts of each other. From factory, Toyota do have two different diff ratios in the front and rear of the car. Now, this creates a bind or a preload that allows the four-wheel drive system to work in the way that Toyota have manufactured it. Because of that, um, we believe that that is arguing with the dyno. The dyno is trying to control it. It's just not working. Um, and in the case of maybe a single retarder, smaller dyno that doesn't have as much inertia, you may not see the problem arise as often or you may not see it at all when you're tuning the car. In a larger dyno with twin retarders on the rear axle, you'll probably find that you might get one, maybe two runs, and then you'll encounter this strange problem where power just magically changes when you haven't made a change inside the ECU. Well, it's my very first MoTeC in any car I've owned since I got into cars over 20 years ago, and I will say this, the hype is real. It is absolutely exceptional. Most cars, when you put an aftermarket ECU in, or especially older stuff, you just know. Something isn't the same as factory. Something isn't quite there. But with the MoTeC, it starts and drives perfectly. You would not know any difference from factory other than the fact that when you put your foot down, you have more power and torque. Uh, getting a lesson from Ryan about all the functions in the ECU and how everything works is incredible. Watching all of its uh, target lambda, target boost, and the way that ECU operates, it's incredible. We could do a whole other video on just how good it is and how good the data logging is, and we probably will. Now, there are a few little things that don't work on the Yaris anymore, but the funny part is they're all things that I hate. Basically, anything to do with the radar that's at the top of the windscreen no longer works. Why? It has a rolling code that essentially can't be hacked by anything external of the factory ECU. But I don't care because it was used for collision avoidance system, which I wish I could turn off because it's nearly crashed the car twice in residential back streets while driving along. Um, I no longer have active cruise control, which you can't use in Australia because if you keep that distance, people will just cut in front of you nonstop. Uh, and also the lane assist doesn't work anymore. And I despise and loathe that system in this car so much that I turn it off whenever I drive the car anyway. So. The things that don't work are things that I don't use anyway. But what I do gain is launch control and a hell of a lot better drivability, power and torque. So let's go to Wakefield and get our lap record back. Should be perfect conditions. Sun on track, warm track and cold air. Like I said, it's a yep. Perfect. All right, yeah, Bozo, um, your briefing is steer good, fast go. He's in. All right, let's just go send it. <laughs> Tenths quicker in our PB, so a 106.2. Give us some feedback. What's it doing? Why isn't it quick? Why isn't it massively quicker? Has it got more grunt? Your tyres letting the suspension, letting it down now. What's happening? Yeah, I reckon it's a, a number of things now. Like, um, it's definitely got more grunt down low, but it seems to me that it runs out of puff up high. Um, and, uh, and when you pull a gear, it's actually got a, a bit of lag now, so it's not as responsive. Uh, as it was even in standard form. Um, so yeah, I think we just need to sharpen that up, whether it's a tune thing or, or not. Obviously, super cold today, so it doesn't really suit, um, you know, essentially a, a slick tire. So just trying to get some heat into them. So then, you know, we've got enough rear grip because it's obviously oversteering on entry, trying to control that, but it's, it's really struggling with front grip. 
um, on corner exit as well. So it's just it's getting a lot of wheel spin and it's got in, getting a lot of understeer as well. So that can happen obviously when you put more power into the car. So obviously, yeah, diffs and all that sort of stuff, um, you know, can, can help things, but we don't have that. So now that we're changing uh, power, we need to probably change the setup of the car a little bit as well, just to try and, you know, help the car as much as we possibly can and obviously get the most out of that tune. So, um, but you know, for the first session, honestly, I, I felt that like I was driving probably eight tenths thereabouts, you know, um, you know, you still feel that there's more speed to come, um, but not in that session. So I think if we just tune the car up a little bit, maybe get a little bit more heat in the day, like the times are definitely gonna come down. So, you know, there's, there's probably at least another second, second and a bit, I reckon, in it. Which is what we need. Absolutely. If you could change anything to right now, so adjustments we can do today is obviously sway bars is the only thing we can probably adjust. The rear is now on full hard, the front is on medium. Yep. Um, the tyre pressure was, well, I think, 32 in the front when you came back in? Yeah. What in the rear? 31. Pretty much bang on, right? Let's just stiffen the, uh, the front up a little bit and, uh, and leave the rear where, where it is. As I said, we'll just take a little bit of rear bar out of it just to try and settle the bum a little bit and uh, we'll just chase the front a little bit. That's where we need to go, I think. Let's do it. Cool. All right. We're PB, but let's go get a record. Just swap in the sway bar settings. Yeah, it's going a little bit softer in the... Yeah, I've done it once before. Uh, yeah, so just uh, finished adjusting the dampers. I've gone two clicks harder than what we were just on the previous run. Uh, combined with the changes we just made to the computer, hopefully it'll uh, get us in that nice time bracket we're looking for. All right, so data is very important. And now that we have a MoTeC, we can get a lot more of it. When we had a factory ECU trying to use OBD logging, what did we discuss? 10, was it 10 hertz? 10 hertz. 10 so, hertz, so well, how often could we look at data on that? Well, effectively, what happens there with OBD is that you get a sensor update 10 times every second. Now, when that data is compounded, so for example, if you log engine speed and boost and maybe throttle position, those three things then basically reduce that logging rate. So you may get to a point, let's say if you logged 10 channels, you're logging one channel per second for an update rate, which when you're actually terrible. looking at lap times and, and real data, it's horrible. See, I noticed when I looked at OBD data before, and I only had like, say, four things I was looking at, it would have the most random boost. If you plotted the Excel document into a graph, it was retarded. It, it just, instead of being a smooth curve for boost or speed or whatever, it was just all over the shot. It was almost useless. That's you, could, right. you, you could have an oil pressure go to, say, 60, and then be 30 after it, but you missed the bit where it kept climbing and then dropped. So, it was useless. But now that we have a motor, we got everything. So That's right. the first best example of what's happening right now that is gonna help us go quicker is, we noticed while driving that uh, both at the drags for its first test and around the track with Bozo, is that when you get back on the throttle, there's a slight hesitation, almost feels laggy, uh, which it didn't factory. So you've got to get to the bottom of that. And essentially with all that data, we can work out what boost was doing, what AFR was doing, what the throttle was doing, what the wastegate position was even doing. Yep. And we've worked out that because this has a wastegate that's naturally open when you turn boost control off, based on the factory algorithm, what was happening is when you get back on the throttle, obviously when you've got off the throttle completely for a gear change, the wastegate has opened, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. So just the inertia of that wastegate trying to close again as you get back on the throttle is slowing the throttle response effectively. You wouldn't pick up on that if it didn't have that style of wastegate. You'd be That's probably right. chasing your tail, but the MoTeC could show us all that wastegate position, everything. So we're able to basically now go in, we'll change that now so that the wastegate is going to stay closed even on a zero uh, percent throttle application when you're changing gears which means it should get back on boost like that. So essentially the data showed us what, four PSI it went down to? Yeah, that's right, yeah. So yeah. about four PSI on a shift, which obviously when you're targeting something like 24 or something somewhere yeah. around there, it's a big drop. How's everything else? Oil pressure, water temperature, AFR, what's it like? Absolutely perfect. So there is no other dramas <laughs> at all on the log, which is good. No, no drop in oil pressure, um, especially where it's typical around the fish hook here. Um, yeah, it's, it's been perfect the whole way across. So everything's looking really good. For those watching, kind of trying to work out where we're at with this, this is the first time that a car, or first time a Yaris with a Motec has been around a circuit, right? That's correct. And it's even the first time one with a, with a Motec has been down the drag strip. That's right. There's only one other car that's had one in this and it hasn't gone beyond the dyno with someone else yet. That's so right. So this is the first time the guys at Powertune have had one at a drag strip, at a racetrack, got some logs, and this is going to be part of the development for this package so that you guys out there watching it, who have a Yaris that want to buy a Motec, what we're doing right now will benefit what you guys get to do later. So. Um, 
That's what we're here for. You're welcome. <laughs> this is not the same power as Yep, very good. So, um, awesome. You have a... whatever you want with your reason. So, like, the limit is set at seven grand. Um, well, 7,200. So, you can rev it out if you feel that you need it anywhere. Go for it, use it. Um, I noticed, like, we looked at the logs from before. You were shifting it around 6,500, like we said. Like, that was, that was fine. But honestly, like, with any car, like, I, I don't... Use the taco. Yeah. Like obviously, I don't rove or rev things, but you you just, by feel. you're pulling gear by feel. Yeah. And then I, I was pulling gear before I even looked at the taco, and I'm like, it's six, it's around six and a half thousand up. Yeah. yeah. So I could tell straight away. Yeah. yeah. So if you feel like you need more, go for it. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's there. Five, six, two. Another ten. There we <laughs> and, go. And board there. sideways. Let's make that record just that little bit bigger. Yeah. <laughs> Feels like it's got front. There's no doubt about that. Uh, the, the setup's much better than what it was uh, earlier on. So uh, we're controlling this set. Uh, um, that, that sharpness of the, the front end on the exit. It's still got a little bit of understeer, but you know, it could be diff, diff. But you know, we might even try and tighten up the front end a little bit more. A lot more control on the rear still. Took me a couple of laps just to get some confidence in the rear tyres and then just to get some heat into them. Um, so, uh, and then um, obviously riled the lean on a little bit more. Um, still not 100% happy, um, you know, with, with the lap. It's not that easy when you've got a, a really fast car uh, on any track day and, um, and and you're just trying to, you know, find your spot to, to get that lap. But, you know, I understand that's what track days are and if you bring a, um, a, a gun to a knife fight. One oh five six two. Five six two. Awesome. Uh, what was that? The first lap or the second, second lap? The first one was a one oh five seven, and you, you were sideways in it. So um, well, and I know there's more in it just by getting a clear lap because it's a challenge 
you know, bringing a, a gun to a knife fight, um, you know, in these sorts of conditions, just trying to pick your place to go, all right, where, how can we do it? We've got the record, like, understand, like, that lap that we did it, said, lost a half a second at the fish hook, mate, it was like rally style, backing it into the corner. Okay. Can we ask a personal question you don't have to answer? If you want to compare that to the 105.9 record that we just broke, was that a perfect lap, or was that also a lap with more left in it? And oh no, like the, the 105.9 in the um, in the other car, like there wasn't much left in it. Like it was, that was a, it. That was a it was a really good lap. Well, this um, is not a really good lap. No, it's no, it's not. No, no. Okay. No. But, uh, so we've beaten it with time to spare, not beaten it by the skin of our teeth right. with nothing left. And understand we're still chasing a bit of a setup as well. Yeah, like, yeah, you know, yeah. That car was really well set up when it, you know, got into my hands. And the, this car, I think we're still trying to tweak it and yep. trying to was find. Was it better with what we changed between the last session? Oh, it was better. Oh, absolutely. Everything, like, everything, everything better, everything, or just the, engine better, or was suspension better, or what? Oh, what was... I think everything was better. Like you know, the, the heat of the days helped, but definitely better on um, on turning. Like uh, we controlled the rear a little. Bit, it's much better as it is now. We need that number one photo. Come on, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so, in summary, we've learnt a lot today. Um, firstly, Ryan did, I would, would you say leaps or baby steps or steps for the Motec? Certainly steps forward, that's for sure. Yeah, I, I think there was certainly major progress that will influence how the Yaris package goes out to people from now on. Yep. Um, I think we probably learnt more about the Motec on the track today than. 10 dyno sessions ever would, so I'm pretty happy with where the car's developed. Definitely a better car, it's definitely got more grunt, definitely drives better, it's just better in every way. We also learnt that the chassis in this car is probably not quite dialed and the extra power has probably started showing that more. When you had factory power, you didn't notice some of the things. The big thing Bozo said was, we've never actually spent a day developing the car. Every time we come here is, we do something at the shop, we come here, we give the keys to Boz and say, go break a lap record. So Boz says that, that's good and bad. It's good because we come here, get this a car, run a PB, go home. So we're doing really well with a lot of educated guesses, I could say, yep. but we've never actually spent a full day here just trying to develop. So there is more in this package. You can talk about traffic and conditions or whatever, but genuinely we haven't done a day of development. So we think there's definitely a 104 without changing anything. Does that mean we won't change anything? No. <laughs> so much more to do. There's so much more to do. There's still standard airbox, standard turbo, standard. It, the whole car is stock except for an exhaust and a Motec. That's it from power wise. Stock clutch, stock gearbox, stock diffs. So we've still got diff development, engine development, and refinement of the chassis. So there's a lot of areas to go quicker, and um, I'm pretty pumped to do that. You want to go 85 next? Oh, we can do that. Let's try 85. Yeah. You heard it's it here. Fun. Let's do it. Well, Wakefield was a great learning experience. We've got a lot of data, which is going to help develop the Yaris software and obviously the base map tune that you get with the car, which is going to help the viewers out there if they get a MoTeC for their GR Yaris as well. We do plan on going back to go quicker. We're going to hit some other racetracks as well. But for now, we want to go to the drag strip and see if we can break the record of 12.62 to become the quickest GR Yaris down the quarter mile in the world. Let's go.
love it when project cars work and you get your goal. It's the best feeling. I don't care if we're just the quickest garage for two days. We did it. That's all that mattered. And we did it with just an exhaust and a Motec. That's it. We're only just getting started. Obviously, there's plenty more left to go. So, yeah. All right. The first pass was junk. Yes. Tires were cold. Gearbox was cold. It just didn't have enough heat in it. Mm -hmm. Um, and was just not even worth talking about. I knew it was terrible. I try, and then I used that run to try some gear ratio tests. Yep. And I actually found that going into fifth early didn't work on that run, but it was rev limiter in fourth on that run. So I could have gone more mile an hour. I actually hit the rev limiter. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll lift the rev limiter. I like your thinking. And you won't hit it this time. <laughs> um, but yeah, we've got it. 12.4, 111. Um, not the best 60 I've done, but good enough. Yep. I'm not sure how much better we'll go tonight, but we'll drop some tyre pressures, up the rev limiter a little bit, give it another go, and um, so hey, it even if it doesn't do any better, we're there. And yeah, that just right. shows you, exhaust, at a Motec. You go fast. You go fast. <laughs> <laughs> actually still a 1244 even with a slower 60 but then the mile was 110 so obviously the car was a little bit quicker over the sort of like the first bit of the track perhaps I'm not sure like it's the the one eighth time is actually the same pretty much so yeah interesting interesting that it was still just as quick with wheel speed mile an hour could have been affected by the fact that I lowered the tire pressures so a lot of little things going on here because we're just small little increments well, there you go. We promised we'd get our lap record back and be the quickest Yaris in the world by just installing a Motec, and we have delivered. But here's the best part. Really, tuning starts now. We can start putting it into coolers and testing ethanol and bigger injectors, turbo upgrades. Now, we really can develop the Yaris platform because we have the Motec and we can basically do anything to the car and we're able to tune for it. So, where to next? everywhere. Stay tuned because we're going to be working with Powertune, Golby's Parts, Motec and a bunch of other supplies to be testing even more performance parts on this Yaris to go even quicker. Uh, there's a few other guys out there that want that drag racing record as well so I guess the race is on to be the first into the 11s with a Yaris but of course we just want to keep going quicker at the track as well.